Hi everybody, my name is Sarah Ovlek Spiker and today you are in for a treat. I have the joy and privilege of welcoming my college basketball coach, Stephanie Gately, to talk about intentional leadership, to talk about turning adversity into your own advantage. And especially what I love about you, coach, is your legacy. And talking to players who have been through your programs, we love you after all these years as much as we did when we first met. <laughs> So I want to bring this into conversation these days when a lot of leaders are really struggling with not only taking care of their teams, but really getting into resources of how to empower their teams, how to bring everybody on the same page and how to see the bigger vision and not just trying to figure out day to day to day to day. So first and foremost, welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm excited to be here and I'm very very flattered that you had me here, Sarah. I love you too. You know, it's so funny because when we were scheduling this, there was, um, it was like, oh, scheduling glitch a little bit. And it reminded me the first <laughs> time we met in Poland and I was supposed to come for practice. <laughs> I remember. And I'm standing there with my purse with cute outfit and you open the door of the taxi and like, where's your outfit? I was like, what where's outfit? Your outfit? outfit? For dinner? <laughs> I remember that. I do remember that. That's funny. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> so where are you right now? How's your life looking up right now? Oh, well, you can see my pups. They're, they're really tired and exhausted. And <laughs> um, you know what? As everybody, you know, we're, we're dealing with adversity, but I, I think as a leader, you have to figure out how to find the good things in adversity and adverse times. And so, you know, I've done a lot on social media of just trying to stay positive. I mean, you yeah. can choose faith or you can choose fear. I mean, you can't have both. So, you know, you have to try to go in the direction that you will see some positive outcomes. Yeah. And I remember that also as a player, that was one of your biggest philosophies. Um, and the story that I always share I mean, with my audience was um, a couple of weeks into our practicing, I was this shy, closed person, quiet, and you're like, I'm not having any of this. You put me in the middle of the court, the team was sprinting, it was like, you can speak or they sprint. So this choice, you know, the option, you always have a choice. And uh, so many memories here. <laughs> <laughs> all good, all good. No, but it is so true. Like how, where do you find this inspiration? Where do you find this strength and um, ability to really keep your mind and keep your focus on the positive and sometimes even in basketball when you start the season you don't know who the players are going to be you don't know how things are going to go but you know you're going for this championship um and you know you're going to get there so even now we don't know what's going to happen we just know that the other side is going to be so much better than it's been so where do you find this inner strength and self-reliance and ways to not only go for yourself but to lead the path and, and create the path for so many to follow well i think i mean i, I think coaching a team is a lot like business i mean it, the end result is are you going to meet your numbers you know you're going to get your numbers are you going to be able to lead the people to get their numbers um it's it's all very similar i mean i brought my brother-in-law bruce lefkowitz who was the vice president of advertising for fox and to speak to our staff and our team because i think there's so much parallel to the business world and the coaching world and um you know you can lead you can follow or you can get out of the way right so mm -hmm. i mean I, I was reading something yesterday about you know we're listening to a podcast about leadership and they said you have the, the, the leaders that are in front, obviously they're gonna lead the way. You have leaders on your side, that the ones that are gonna hold your hand. And mm -hmm. you have leaders that are behind, they're gonna kind of push you to your goals. So um, you have a lot of different type of leaders. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for me, I, I was, I'm one of eight. I was raised, you know, Catholic and I was, you know, uh, I was raised in a big family that we didn't have a lot of money, but we had a lot of love. And, and the way that I was raised is, you know, I just felt like we always kind of found the positive in tough situations. So. As you said, when you're when you're getting ready to start a new quarter in business, or you're ready, getting ready to start your know, your first part of your season, um, you know you, you have to establish goals and, and what your short term goals are and what your long term goals are. And I'm a win the day type person. I'm not gonna. I don't think you can win the championship unless you win the day. Mm -hmm. So it starts with little goals. Like, all right, 
we want to be the best players we can be, the best students we can be, and the best people we can be. Because mm -hmm. ultimately, when people ask me, like, how do I take programs and win and change them? I think the number one thing is how you treat people. Yeah. You know, if you treat people with respect and you treat people with dignity and you listen to them and you care about them, I think you're going to get more out of them. And so I think that has a lot to do with where I've been successful as a coach. But I think that's that carries over into any field of life. And so for us, when we start off the season, obviously, you're going to have high aspirations and high goals like anybody else would. When you're building a business, you're going to have high goals and you're going to, I'm going to reach those numbers, but how do you get there? You know, so yeah. it, it's definitely a process and the process is, you know, it's kind of like, it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. You know, you got to take little steps at a time and, and celebrate the little successes. And when you have the little setbacks, what I learned from that setback that can push us forward. Do you mind if we tap into this process a little bit more? Because from where I see it, uh, this systematic approach is like you as a leader, you're in the center. Then you need to surround yourself with the right staff. Then you need to surround yourself with the right team members who characteristics wise, skill wise fit in what is that you're trying to create. And then all in the same time, you need to show each person how to tap into their own genius so that they feel empowered and take ownership of what is that they're doing. So they're not just following. And like I said, you know, um, it's how you treat people. I think it's going to be the big asset for the companies of the tomorrow that are being built right now. What's going to set them apart is how you treat people. So can you take us through this process of um, how you build and develop your own teams? Well, you know what? We, here is what we won the championship in 2014 and um, it, it gave us the opportunity because more people knew about the university and our program to, to kind of um, put a, a higher range on who we could choose players from. And, and I feel like I made a mistake. I went after some higher talented kids, but I felt that the character of the person was sacrificed. And um, I learned a lot through that mistake. And I, I ended up throwing both those kids off the team and I had to revisit what really, what type of person I wanted to be around every day. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was I decided I wanted to meet the parents, you know, I wanted to meet the person that had the most, you know, impact on them because I think that influence is, is critical at that stage in their life. So um, I'm now willing to sacrifice talent for, sorry, for, 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 for character person. He's out of the room. Um, so I, uh, I've decided that, you know, my goal right now is, and I think where I've done a much better job in my later years as a coach, better than when I coached you was, I think I'm a better listener. Mm -hmm. And I think I've done a better job of letting the people that like don't play a lot or might be the walk on, making sure they know that they're equally important. Because mm -hmm. in that, if you can get the people that are, that are in your business or whatever that you're doing, that might not be the high numbers people, but they're still a critical part of your success. If you get them to realize their importance, you're going to get so much more out of them. And at the end of the day, they're going to be working with everybody to make you successful. So I think a lot of our success is making the individuals feel so important so that the, that the whole is, is, is much greater because of that. I remember those days when, um, and it happened even prior to being coached by you. You know, I remember from home, uh, but it was a different take on it. I almost say um, that once I started college basketball, it was like mindset 2.0. Everything was 2.0 from one on one. <laughs> but I do remember the struggle sometimes uh, my teammates would go through. I had the privilege of being the starters to be one of the top players for most of the time. We're going to talk about my second year when I almost quit everything. <laughs> um but I remember those struggles and conversations of having to shift perspective that, yes, yeah, somebody might not be on the court all the time, but they are a crucial part of the team behind the scenes. And one of the exercises we keep kept doing, and it has been so profound, was this chain. Rather than chain is only, only as strong as the weakest link. Um, so what are some of the tools that you could um, share that you're utilizing? Um, as a leader to really help person find their own position when they themselves are filled with doubt, when they don't believe in themselves, when they feel they don't belong, 
or some of them might be facing adversity at home and they're distracted. How, what are some of the tools, what are some of the ways that anybody who's facing this right now can help? Well, I think, first of all, you got the first part is admitting that you, that you have those fears or you have those doubts, because unless we can honestly talk about them, we can't help or change it. Mm-hmm. So it's developing, and a big part is developing that trust in that relationship where kids feel comfortable enough to open up. Like if I bring them in and say, you know what, you just look like you're struggling today. You know, why? You know, what is it? You know, and then finding out what it is. Maybe it's something that happened at home. Maybe it's a relationship. And getting to the bottom of that to give them the advice to get out of that, you know. So I think a big part is understanding the problem that you're dealing with first because everybody you meet is going through something, right? You know, there's nobody that's not dealing with some type of hardship. And, you know, some are going to make it, some are going to be more difficult than others. And, you know, I I can help solve a financial, you know, situation for a friend, you know, by lending them money. But if it's a mental thing, I can't solve it that easily. I got to know what exactly what's going on with our players. Obviously we can't give them money. So is it a confidence about not playing? Is it, is a relationship? Is it a test you just failed? So first it's finding out the problem. Mm -hmm. We got to identify what the problem is to figure out how to deal with it. And then once we we're able to know what the problem is, I've got to decide, is it something I can help them with? You know, is there somebody better suited on our staff? That's why I think it's so important that our staff is diversified so that maybe there's somebody younger they'd rather talk to or, or somebody of a different color or a different country mm-hmm. um, or somebody like me that it, you know, has more wisdom because I'm older, you know, what is it? What's best suited? And if it's beyond that, you know, from our standpoint with players, if it's beyond that, then do we have them go to our, you know, psychological services because it's, because I'm not equipped to help them with that. Mm-hmm. Um, depends how deep that problem may be. Yeah. That was something that I remember I did my second year. Um, I had personal struggles that affected the team, but I was so oblivious to them that (laughs) for those who might not be aware um, from my audience here, um, my sophomore year in college, I came back, I gained a lot of weight over the summer and I was extremely homesick and uh, it was just total opposite from my freshman year. And one of our teammates who was redshirted decided to leave earlier. She went back home to New Zealand and we had to bring her back for her to play instead of me. And I remember when you told me about it, it's was like, yay, she's coming back. <laughs> and your look was like, are you crazy? It's because you are not doing your own job. Um, but I do know how important it was. Something clicked. I got to get um, those additional support um, and then got myself back into physical shape. And then everything started to fall into a place. And then third and fourth year were amazing. Um, so those challenges definitely, I think, are such an important part of the process. But how do you create a safe space, first and foremost, especially when somebody is in a job and they feel like I can't go to my boss or to my leader to talk about my personal issues because I'm here to do my job and they compartmentalize themselves? That, that's, tif- that's a difficult question question in that relationship just because you're right you know like if if you show an inadequacy there's somebody else that'll take that job over right it's a little different than coaching when um when our relationship that we've developed has has created trust but if you know and i've read read a lot on you know leadership and different type of leaders and I mean, I think you, you have to have somebody, whether it might not be the person that you're, you know, your ultimate report, but your, your next report that you can at least share what you're going through. Now, there's certain things that you got to be able to control on your own, whether, because yeah. you got to be able to work through, you know, there, and I think any good leader would be able to tell you that, hey, Sarah, you know, just because you didn't get enough sleep, that's not on me, you got to bring it, you know, yeah. but if, if you have a loss in your family, you know, or something, you know, really, really serious happens. That's a different conversation that I think most leaders would understand and give you that little bit of room to kind of find yourself during that time. So I I think, you know, a good leader is going to be honest. There's times in conversations with our best player this year that I'm like, get over yourself, you know, like this, you're making something big out of something that's very small. And then she's had serious issues where I've said, I'm here and we just, let's hug it out, you know? So like, you've got to be able to be honest and differentiate for them what those issues are that they've got to be able to move forward to. And if you're not working for someone that, you know, that can understand, you know, and I've, I've been around a lot of people who said they've worked with people that really don't care if you've got a loss in your family or you, you're going through a personal, you know, tragedy. You know, 
I don't know how long I want to work for that person because, mm -hmm. you know, life is, as we know through what we're going to do now, life is just way too short yeah. and we, we've got to find a common space, so to speak. Absolutely. Let's shift the conversation a little bit to the other side of the coin. Right now we were talking about the struggles and uh, finding the strength to go through adversity. There's another phenomena, I think, especially in sports as well as entrepreneurship when the floodgates open and everything is there and you freeze out of the fear of success. It's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> everything's happened. We're about to win the game. We're going to win the championship and the fear of the unknown, what's on the other side? <sighs> what's your experience with that? And uh, what do you do in those in such situations? Well, I mean, I've been there, you know, um, certainly I've been there and I think if I, if the advice I could give to the young version of myself is um, play to win, you know, whether it's in entrepreneurship or whether it's in basketball games and, you know, rather than playing not to lose, you know, mm -hmm. and there's a difference because there's a feeling of freedom with playing to win rather than playing not to lose, you know, playing not to lose, there's a fear involved and playing to win means I'm going to take chances and I'm going to take risks. And I, I found myself, you know, allowing more, you know, allowing more flexibility as I've gotten older. I, hey, what do you think? Like asking, like, we'll, we'll be sitting on the bench and, or even like prior to even the game happening, you know, like even in the business standpoint, all right, you know, we're dealing with sales and I'm dealing with basketball. And I'll say to our point guard or whoever your key, you know, person is in your business and saying, what do you find success with? You know, what is your best tactic? And I, so I'll ask my player, what are you most comfortable with at the end of the shot clock? You know, like um, their opinion. And, and, and I think it doesn't mean as a leader that you have to do what they say, but I think the fact that you listen to them makes a big difference because then they feel that you trust them. And then if you can say to them, hey, I really like that, but I think we're going to go in this direction because of this. Mm -hmm. you know, but I love the fact of that idea, keep bringing those ideas to me because then, then the person that you work with feels like you respect their opinion and that you're willing to listen rather than shutting them right down and saying, no, we're doing it my way because yeah. only because it's my way, not necessarily that it's the right way. It's just, I'm the leader and we're going to go my way. Mm -hmm. I found that the more open and the more aware I am of the opinions of my staff, I mean, I hired you to challenge me mm -hmm. and of my players, I recruited you because I trust you. You know, so I've got to kind of back up how I, you know, got to back that up with giving yeah. them a voice. Mm -hmm. So like, um, you play the way you practice. Absolutely. It really comes down to that. So Absolutely. what are some of your personal, um, rituals or, um, customs or that might not even be a word. Um, something that you do for yourself, if you have any daily things that you do for yourself to keep yourself grounded, to keep yourself, you know, focused on the future and visualizing and uh, feeling it happen before it actually manifests in reality. Well, the first thing I do every day is get down on my knees and pray. That's just who I am. And I'm, you know, not this person that's going to throw my religion in front of you. But for me, when I give it up to somebody that's higher than me, then I feel like I can say to them, Hey, I can't handle this. Can you help me through this? Mm -hmm. And even my day, uh, I'm just, the first thing I do, you know, which is as a kid, you, you are asking for things and as an adult and get being older, I thank for things, you know, so I get up and say, thank you so much for this. Mm -hmm. And then I work out and, and that helps clear my mind. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very disciplined as far as that's concerned. I like to read. I like to do self-help books. I want to, I don't, I think once you, as a leader or somebody that's in the working world or in the coaching world, once you feel you've learned it all, then you're, then you're never able to learn more. So I'm always looking to learn. I'm always looking for ideas. Like I'm, I'm super proud of seeing what you're doing, Sarah. I think you've had an impact on a lot of people and that's such a big thing. And, and I can learn from what you're doing. And in the same way you said, like I can learn from the basketball field for those in the business field or those are, you know, trying to be entrepreneurs. And I think they're all very, you know, there's a, a correlation between all of them. Absolutely. And one of the things that really stood out when, um, you know, even as a player, when you're so consumed and you're part of this bubble almost when nothing else exists except for the school and basketball, uh, one of the things that really stood out for me was preparation for life. You know, that there's traits, there's this discipline that you mentioned, and then there's um, just ability to master your own mindset because just like 
and I keep using this analogy with my own clients, like you're standing in a free throw line. It's uh, you're about to win or lose based on the free throw. And there's the opposite fans. They're making noises, but all you can see, you can tune everything out. You see this rim in front of you, you have basketball in your hands and you tune everything out and the muscle memory comes up because mm -hmm. you have done it so many times. You visualize it, you felt it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's one of the things that I do believe personally is crucial for anybody, entrepreneurship, business leadership, corporate or private sector, um, whether you're in a position to lead people or you're somebody who's just, I don't want to say just a part of the team, but somebody who's still finding your way mm -hmm. up there, right? Um, I thought you wanted to say something. Oh, no, I'm just listening. Okay. <laughs> so um, another question that I have for you that comes through is, even with the demanding schedule and so much responsibility that you have towards the team, towards uh, commitment to the university and your staff, um, what have you found to be some of the best practices to find a balance with family? Because you mentioned you have a big family, you have three amazing sons. Um, you and Frank have been together for a long time. Um, and I know family is a huge part of who you are. Well, I mean, the balance, I mean, it's like anything. If, if, if you want something, you're going to go do it, right? And, and you said it, you know, like um, when you get to that foul line and, and I teach shooting and I like what you said, you know, when it comes down to it, it's really, you know, muscle memory. And, and I tell kids all the time, I think, what are you thinking when you go to the line, right? And they're thinking, I want to make it. I said, well, you get that out of your mind. You know, like you just going to think process because that's where the repetition comes in. Don't, don't think. I have to make this because there's all these people around me cheering or not cheering or, or they're relying on me. Take that, that puts too much pressure. So what you gotta, you gotta do at this point is you just gotta think the process, you know, what have I worked on every day? I'm up over and in, up over and in, and whatever, you know, whatever field that that may come into. Like for me, I, you know, I think like as a parent, when I reflect back now that my kids are all older, I, the youngest is in college, but I take so much pride in knowing that they're, they're in the sport of basketball, which means being around it, they loved it, you know, because, you know, we, I, when they're little, like at your, like your kid's age, you're so worried about missing that moment, right? And missing that, that birthday party or that special moment. And I laugh now because I'm like, do you remember that Power Ranger party? And they're like, no. And I'm thinking, oh my God, it was a live and die moment when you're in it. But when you're older, you don't even remember it. So that made me realize, like, okay, those things I was beating myself up about, you know, I think I did make the most of the moments, you know. And what I've learned as I've gotten older, and, and I would encourage this to those in business or, you know, sports or whatever, is celebrate those moments, you know. Whether it's one of my players that hasn't made a left-hand layup in practice saying, great job. Or it's somebody that got that sale that you know really was working hard. Celebrate that moment. It might not have met. They might not yet. It might not be the end of the quarter, and they might not have reached all their numbers. But they got that one sale that they were working so hard for. Celebrate it because the more you celebrate, the more they gain so much energy and so much confidence through the little celebrations. At the end, end of the day, you're probably going to push them to even being more successful. So for me to find a balance is is connection. Like I think I do a good job of you know, reaching out to the kids and staying in touch. And I think, you know, communication is such a huge part to every aspect of life. So, um, and, you know, just, you know, relation, like relationships are huge to me and my relationship to you, even though we might not see each other, I always know I can call you and, 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 and you can help me or vice versa. And that we're always connected. And, but that's true. The fact that during holidays, we're like text and say, Hey, Sarah, or birthday, Sarah, I'm so happy for you. Hey, great job. And, yeah. you know, and we do that for each other. And that's part of building relationships. And with my own, you know, I have my husband who's been retired, but we've been married 38 years and it works because we balance each other well and respect each other. And with the kids, you know, two of them are now coaching in the NBA and the ones playing at the university of Richmond. And, um, you know, we enjoy each other's success and, and we find, you know, and as I've gotten older, I've gotten more appreciative of it and I don't take it for granted anymore. Mm -hmm. <sighs> I said, I remember when the little one was really little. <laughs> I know, years me ago. too, Sarah, me too. So one final question, because I know um, 
otherwise you and I can talk for another three days. <laughs> Um, right now with connection and basketball in particular is a team sport when you're used to being around everybody, when you're used to being a part of a team and especially as an athlete, you room together, you go to class together, you travel together, you practice together, you play together. How are the team players dealing with this isolation right now? And what are some of the ways that you and your staff are helping them stay connected to themselves and with each other? So then when everything resumes and everybody comes back on campus, you guys can continue your success story. It's funny you say that because I feel more connected to them now. It's kind of weird, even though I saw them every day, but it's a conscious effort to be in touch, like to call them, to reach out, to do the Zoom calls. You know, I feel now like I'm really getting to know them. Mm -hmm. um, this week we're going through their uh, postseason evaluations and allowing them to speak a lot on their year and what they need to improve on, what they did well, what have you. But um, as a staff, we, we've talked as a staff about how we got to stay connected to all our players. And of course, the business of recruiting, which, you know, is, is the main thing, obviously, of building a program. But um, I just think it's so important. The one thing I'm the most proud of in my most recent years of coaching is how the kids that don't play at all feel equally important. So I feel like we're doing a really good job of that. And that's something that means a lot to me because it's kind of like as a parent, you're only as happy as your unhappiest kid. Right. So, um, you know, at the end of the bench, that kid that never gets in. And then when you're going over their postseason report and you're talking to them and, and saying, what can the coaches do to help you? And they said, you guys are doing everything. You guys are great. You're checking in on me, whether I play or don't play, you're always challenging me. Um, that speaks volumes of, of our staff. And, uh, and, and I think as anybody that's a business person, sometimes when you're the lead person or the CEO or what have you, um, yeah. Do you need to trust in others? Yeah. I trust in my staff to, to, to also play their part, mm -hmm. but you don't want to become that person. Like I laugh when they're like, coach, I was so scared to come in the office and I laugh. I'm like, why? You know, like, Hey, I'm, I'll listen to you. I might not tell you what you want to hear, but I'll absolutely listen to you. So during this time we're doing, you know, one thing we've done was I sent a book out and it's kind of like the sisterhood of the traveling pants. Like once you've done it, you got to send us to the next player and then they got to send it and you got to you know put a little note next to what you liked from it. it it's a book by Kevin Eastman about how the best become the best. And it, mm -hmm. it's about business and about coaching. It's a great book. And, um, and that way, and then we'll eventually talk about as a team. The other thing we do a Zoom call every Friday and we've taken our last game. We've broken the team up into groups and each group has to break down that one quarter of our last game and tell us what was good, what was bad, what we can do better, how can we move forward. Just again, engaging them in communication, mm -hmm. um, keeping them connected, not letting time go by without talking. Yeah. Um, checking on their families. Are they okay? Are they safe? You know, nobody knows... How Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care, right? A cliche, but it's really true. It is. Thank you, Coach, so much for taking the time to be here today and for all your wisdom. I really, really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you, and you know I love you, Sarah, and I wish you nothing but the best. And we'll see you soon when the world great. presses the resume button. <laughs> yeah, I look forward to it. Thank you so much. And to the audience, stay well, stay safe. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thanks, Sam. Take care.